it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Sisters, it is the Remnant Warrior here from Kingdom Productions and Publishing. And I just want to welcome all of you who don't already watch this channel on a regular basis. I want to let you know that we upload new content several times a week, but at least every week. So... You don't want to miss out when we upload something new. Thank you all in advance for your subscription. I love each and every one of you. Until next time, God bless you all. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our annual special edition Exposing Halloween edition of the Remnant Report. This is an episode that, although it is on a subject that truly saddens me when I think of how many Christians have been deceived into taking part in it, it's still an episode that I look forward to every year because we always put together a good episode with very good guests who are extremely knowledgeable. And this year is absolutely no exception. This year, our special edition exposing Halloween episode is of course hosted by myself the remnant warrior along with my co-host brother courteous 40 but we've got joining us today we've got three guests joining us as opposed to one like we've had years past but we do one of those guests is um, one of the guests that has joined us in the years past, and he's a man who needs no introduction on the Kingdom Productions Network and on the Remnant Report because uh, he is absolutely just a man with the mind of an encyclopedia, but he's also a man that... <laughs> You guys, the Remnant Report and the other Kingdom Productions Network programs just truly admire and love to watch and listen to because every episode that Brother Gary Wayne, who is the guest I'm referring to, is on, gets more views than any other episode or video on the channel and 
our next guest that will be taking part in today's roundtable discussion, Exposing Halloween, is none other than the, the Christian Indiana Jones himself, Dr. Judd Burton. And last but not least, his, uh, I don't want to say rival because they're not rivals, they're brothers in Christ, but the only other man in the Christian or any other world for that matter who rivals Dr. Burton for the title of the Christian Indiana Jones is our third and final guest, Dr. Aaron Judkins. However, Unfortunately, Dr. Aaron Judkins had something come up, and so he's going to be late, very late. Um, he's not going to be able to join us until the end. So just because um, we're getting towards the end, have no fear and definitely don't leave because there's still more to come. In fact, uh, there is Dr. Aaron Judkins to come. So I am going to turn it over to the two guests that are, are here and allow them to introduce themselves and say a few things about whatever they want to say and just welcome them on and it is without any further ado that I welcome and turn things over to Dr. Judd Burton. Dr. Burton, how are you? I uh, have, have just uh, in recent years focused more attention on, on bringing my scholarly training uh, into focus on, on these topics. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here to, to talk about that. And we are definitely happy and excited to have you back on. Um, it's been almost a year, not quite, but I don't know. Maybe it, 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 I think it's been right at right out a year. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know it, it was around this time last year, um, right. Brother Gary. Uh, I don't think anybody will have a clue who you are. You're a, a definitely a newcomer to the. <laughs> uh, give us give us a little bit of of background on you, brother. Yeah, it, it helps to be anonymous these days. I think so. That's always a good thing. And uh, so, yeah, my my name's Gary Wayne. I'm the author of the Genesis Six Conspiracy Part One. And for people who aren't aware of it, there's a part two coming out. Uh, also for the audience is, is they're out a little bit ahead of me, even though the release date is March 12th now because of publishing issues. Uh, but it is up on Amazon and I'm not sure where else yet. I'm still catching up and I'll have my website ca caught up to uh, reflect what's going on at that end. Um, but, but I do have a generous excerpt of all 84 chapters up of the new book with the uh, table of contents. So you'll get a good feel for the book. And as soon as I can get the rest of the website up for pre-bookings on my end, uh, I'll have that up as well, hopefully over the next week or two. So sorry to, to throw that in, but I'm kind of catching up on some things that have been a little bit chaotic at this end. So yeah, I'm a Christian contrarian and I'm an author and uh, I tend to bring them some things to the table for people that maybe they haven't connected the dots on and hopefully in the process I'll raise some eyebrows but what I try and do as well is is bring logic to the argument and uh, facts to the debate and then you can decide what you want to decide and you know Halloween is is absolutely one of those topics where we need to talk more sort of about it um I'm not anti-celebrations, and if people want to celebrate Halloween, that's fine, but they should know what they're celebrating, and so I enjoy coming on shows like this just to put some of that on the table and spread some information that people can uh, digest themselves and decide what they believe. Well, um, just so everyone's clear, you and I have actually talked about this several times, so I know what the answer is, but I don't want anybody to uh, say Gary Wayne said that he celebrated Halloween on the remnant report. So you're not anti celebrations in general, yes. but yes. you're definitely not pro 
celebrating well, Halloween. Well, I'm not pro imposing my views on people. Uh, I have my definite beliefs. I'm a Christian. I think I, I'm uh, talking Christians. About you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that Christians ought to think about some of these celebrations that we live in and make their own decisions on it. My decision is based on my research and things is that people can celebrate all they want. And if I want to participate, I will, but I tend not to participate in, in polytheist rituals. So yeah, I would I stay away from that, of course. Uh, yeah, this is about helping other people understand why we have these positions, but we don't want to look at we're intolerant. We don't want to be looked at as Absolutely. we are fascists or anything like that, but we just want to provide information and, and people have free choice and hopefully they'll choose God. Absolutely. Uh, with your, your book, um, well, both books, uh, I, I can definitely understand why, there's been so much time between the two of them and i don't see how uh there's not 10 more years uh before part two uh but <laughs> i've i've got part one had it for years um it's one of the most information filled books that i own um I said one of it's definitely not the you know I mean I've got things like dictionary of early Christian beliefs and uh, other college type or size I mean textbooks but uh, the Genesis six conspiracy is as big as a college textbook uh, I, I'm sure that there are bigger uh, college textbooks but it is definitely one that I would recommend, and I'm sure the second one is going to be awesome as well. Um, and, you know, we all, always invite our guests to plug their books, uh, website, YouTube channels, uh, schools, in Dr. Burton's case. Um, and, you know, like my co host, Curtis, he just published a book that I think is going to help a lot of people and is actually um, very relevant to today's topic because a lot of people suffer from trauma due to having been a part of uh, satanic rituals that were performed on Halloween and his book is uh, trauma from a, a biblical perspective and we're working I am working as fast as I can to get it published in hardback and paperback right now it's only available in uh, a Kindle ebook but it will be available um, by the beginning of the year in hardback, paperback, and on Audible's uh, audiobook. But I know that today's episode, before we dive headfirst into this very important topic, um, I know it's going to have a lot of people who watch it because. Uh, Every video I have up, even the audio-only podcast episodes with Gary Wayne and the episode from last year with Dr. Burton are the most watched videos I have, but it doesn't matter if the it's... The one we did on CERN that has the most views of any video on the channel or it's an audio episode like the uh, fig tree generation on Buy Their Fruits, um, still over 70% of those of you watching the videos are still not subscribed. So I hope that you'll take the opportunity today to subscribe and even if you don't please 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 hit the like button that like button is one of the most if not the most 
important way that you can help this ministry out because it's the only way the algorithms from YouTube are going to recommend the video to uh, people who aren't subscribed and, you know, people who wouldn't see it otherwise. And without any more rambling from myself, we are going to just kind of chop it up. This is not a formal discussion. This is a, today's episode will be a round table type discussion. We're not going to talk over one another or interrupt one another, but we are going to be as casual as we can. Um, I am going to let you guys choose which one of you wants to go first in explaining whatever you would like to in opening on the holiday of Halloween, whether it's the, the ancient practices, the modern uh, practices, or both. Dr. Burton, you want to start us off? Certainly. Well, I, I've been busy with podcasts this week because everybody wants to talk about this topic this time of the year. Obviously, it's Absolutely. a time. Um, there's, there's such a breadth of, of material to cover, and I, I'm in agreement with, with Gary, and I'm sure Tertius would agree as well, <clears throat> that the, the imagery alone uh, uh, of Halloween harkens to the admonishment from the New Testament about avoiding even the the appearance of evil. Um, and so the, the older that I get, the more sanguine I feel about distancing myself from that sort of imagery. I, I agree with Gary that, that, uh, I'm not, I consider myself a rather gregarious, jovial person. I'm not, I'm not averse to celebrations, but people do need to be wary of, uh, the kinds of, of traditions and spiritual baggage after all that are attached to, uh, a lot of these practices that are, are, whose roots go back not only to antiquity, but even to prehistory, you know, in our interaction with our, our earliest interactions with these fallen entities, fallen Elohim and their progeny, um, you know, sort of set the pace for the kinds of rituals that I'm sure we'll be talking about today uh, that are associated with Halloween. Um, but just, yeah, just in terms of, of, of preparatory marks, just to, to kind of set the chessboard as it were to, today, um, Halloween is probably the most commercially popular holiday that we have in, in the West. Um, it's, it's, I, I'm not, not familiar right off the top of my head with the metrics, but, uh, I, I'm, I would, I would say on a commercial level, it's, it's probably close with Christmas, um, big business, big business. Um, and the, um, uh, again, the imagery and by proxy, the, the traditions that are associated with the history of Halloween um, are in in many cases, certainly to a, a Christian looking looking at it through the biblical lens uh, should be disturbing at the at the very least. Um, but it's given us a rather innocuous glaze uh, so that it's appealing to and probably probably one of the more nefarious aspects of Halloween is how appealing it is to children. I was just getting to say uh, it's the most evil part of it to me is the fact that it is it is geared towards children and uh, drawing children in. It is the holiday that is celebrated most by children and it's considered a children's holiday. I mean, you have adults that go to Halloween parties and such, but we have to remember that Ephesians 6 tells us that, you know, our, our fight is not with flesh and blood. You know, we as believers, and I would dare even say non-believers, even though they aren't aware of it, um, you know, as the, the Bible shows that until we're born again that you know we are children of disobedience but you know e even non-believers have spiritual forces that that are coming against them 
just uh, probably more successfully than they do against a Christian, definitely one who's walking with the whole armor of God. But because it is a extremely spiritually charged celebration and it is a night to where, you know, whether anyone wants to believe it or not, satanic rituals, including sacrifices and um, things that are worse that I'm not going to say and to be certain I don't get this video taken down, there are things that are done on Halloween to spiritually charge the individuals and the atmosphere as a whole and if you are taking part in these things then you're opening doors you're giving the devil a foothold to get into if you're going trick-or-treating or taking your children trick-or-treating does that necessarily mean that you are an evil person, that you're um, a devil worshiper. No, of course not. But it is a very dangerous thing to do. And like you were saying, it's it's geared towards children. It's marketed towards children. And it opens doors to those children if in no other way than through their parents who take them to celebrate this this holiday and or unholy day, and I'm sorry for uh, jumping on the soapbox. I just I, I just wanted to elaborate on what you were saying about the the children aspect of it. Go ahead, Gary. Were you raising your hand to talk? No, I just had to turn my phone a little more silent. There's things coming in, so sorry about that. I, but I always like a chance to talk. But if you had more to say, go ahead. I, I'm... The only thing, I, I would just say one more thing just to set the table, and then I'll pass the torch off to you, Gary. Um, no, the, uh, you know, the interesting thing about this uh, is that, you know, we, we tend to think, and Halloween is certainly certainly uh, ensconced in Celtic tradition, uh, the the germanic and celtic traditions in northern and western europe but the fact of the matter is is that these kinds of festivals that employ uh, necromantic rituals you know the uh, trafficking with the dead the fact of the matter is is that they often coincide with um uh, the harvest uh the the, okay. the ancient agrarian calendars because um, whether you're talking about about the old world or the new world uh there are most of these festivals fall between um august and november uh, and so, you know, whether it's the Samhain that, that uh, Halloween derives from or Pomona that the Romans celebrated um, the uh, in the New World, you have Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, which is rooted in older uh, Mesoamerican and, and even in, in South American pre-Incan tradition. Um, so these that that's really kind of the, the foundation is this idea that the veil is thin so that people could contact the dead or their dead ancestors or or, or dead god kings, as the case would be in the in, in ancient Near Eastern traditions. Um, there's certainly other festivals of the dead throughout the throughout the year. Um, the parentalia that the Romans celebrated in uh, February, but but again, just looking at it statistically, most of these kinds of festivals where people actively sought trafficking with these spirits occurred during the autumn months of the year, and. Uh, on that note, I'll pass the torch off to Gary. Yeah, and that's a very, very important point that you underlined right at the end there is it's a season. It is a full three months that begins in September 21. Uh, that is sort of part of the whole life cycle of the occult. And this is a religious religion and rituals done in different sort of cultural and vernacular ways all around the world on all continents. And who knows what we'll find on Antarctica, just in case anybody's check facting me on the, on the continents um, that Here, were celebrated uh, of old and uh, were uh, all part of that same religion. They just have different names for the gods. This is the season of sort of death, 
and preparing for renewal, which comes in the spring. So you have many occult rituals that are done in this end of the year that has to do with the dead, because it is the time when the leaves fall, a representation of reincarnation. And that I don't know if anybody else is getting it, but I'm getting a lot of uh, like feedback, like echo from when Brother Gary's talking. Uh, I'm so so sorry to interrupt you. I just I was going to ask if um, if it's okay with everybody, can we uh, mute our our microphones when uh, we're not the ones talking? Is that okay with everybody? Yeah, and I was doing that as well. So, but I'm still hearing feedback now that's out there. So when you were talking, so there, whatever there is, it's, it's, yeah, if we, if we can find a way to eliminate it, it would be helpful. Are you still there? I'm still here. I just said okay. I was on mute. Okay. So one of the things that, uh, just sort of continuing about with what we were talking about in terms of it being that sort of season of uh, death with the leaves falling and the celebrations of everything. This is the season that is probably one of the most important seasons of the occult. And certainly the Day of the Dead, All Hallows Eve, um, Sam Hen would be considered for my research probably the most important day. And it's a day that they, uh, and, a, and a season that they have where they can create between the different dimensions in their belief system a connection and everything about it is sort of representing those kinds of connections and typically all hallows eve as part of this it, it's more than just october 31 but it continues that's the beginning and in, in in the ancient tradition and what's still done today and we can see this visually because they do everything in plain sight we have remembrance day uh, at least as we call it in Canada, or Veterans Day on November 11th. Well, that's the end of this season of the dead in ancient tradition. And it's a whole period of other things that are going on. And of course, you have Remembrance Day with the poppies, which is associated with the dead and with the underworld and with Perse Persephone and the Greek mythology and others of their traveling in into the underworld. So... We have to understand that when that veil that um, Dr. Judd was talking about is thin, that's an allegory. Um, and who knows what I'm going to talk about might be an allegory as well. But they believe this is when more portals are available to be opened. And whether or not it's the ones in ancient Celtic color, uh, cultures coming through the fairy domens or the fairy portals, you have the same usage of language all over the world. So then when you have, and it's touching on what uh, Dr. Judd and, and what you were saying, um, how they impose all of this belief system very, I, I think diabolically is the best way to put it, on children. Uh, they prepare them with all of the other entertainment and literature and everything that they're taught for this season so that they'll dress up in imageries that represent their uh, different aspects of their religion, different peoples, different sects of beings type of things, and that they are now um, going into people's houses and knocking on a door, repeating a ritual that was done in the Celtic tradition, opening a door is like opening a portal. So now you're opening an opportunity to the whole populace of people letting these demonic spirits that are, that are coming in that come out on Hallow's Eve in numbers that are, we, can't, we probably can't imagine how many uh, uh, demons would be coming through these uh, these portals at that period of time. So it's an opportunity for them to provide oiketarians or dwelling places for demons um, who are disembodied and would perhaps like to interact in the world. And of course, you see all sorts of these increases of violence and things and people doing uncanny things on Halloween, and it's all all sort of related. So what I would sort of ask people to do is is take us take a step back and say how can there be such an emphasis on something that is so anti-christian anti-bible anti-god and so pro-fallen angels and everything to do with their culture and their history and what they believe is their destiny for the world and you know again if you're a polytheist that's fine i mean 
celebrate it. I would recommend that you search out the Bible, but if you're a Christian, be careful as to how far you're going to participate in rituals, and are you creating opportunities to let evil spirits in? Absolutely. Um, that that was very, very well said. And I just thought about something that this year, whether or not the war will still be raging come Halloween or not is yet to be seen. But during the the season you've got celebration of death and destruction and chaos on several different fronts with the war uh in the middle east that started well a week ago today uh brother Tertius and i did an episode on end times bible prophecy and when we recorded it we didn't even know that war had broken out in israel and it was after we recorded it that i saw the news and i recorded uh an audio a short audio introduction about the conflict and then played a news clip from that morning where it showed you know the how many thousand rockets were shot in to Israel within, you know, like the first hour or hours. And then you have the other war going on in Europe um, between the two neighboring um, countries that, uh, mentioning tend to get your videos taken down here on youtube but i think everybody know what what other uh big war has been raging for um what well over a year now um those are celebrations well the 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 celebration of halloween is celebrating death like the so i guess it would be I, I guess mexico is considered central america or it might be north america i think it's still north america i know it is but like in mexico the the celebration they have there i think is one that and, and it's celebrated here in the united states and in new orleans as well but uh, it's very, it's the one that is mo the most outspoken about what Halloween is truly about. And of course, they've uh, tried to Christianize it with, um, you know, making it coincide with, you know, uh, All Hallows Eve and All Saints Day. But it's ancestor worship. It's, it's worship of demons because you're not contacting your dead relatives. If you are taking part in necromancy, hear me. Your relatives are not the entities that are contacting you back. It is a demon masquerading as your loved one. These demons are disembodied. They are thousands and thousands of years old. Um, I think a very good argument can be made that a uh, principality or uh, unclean spirit, whatever you want to think of it as, is a sign to families and they see everything that your relatives did and your great grandfather and whoever it is you're contacting or attempting to contact with your Ouija board or whatever and so they know the answers to these questions because they saw it happen 
you know, they're not like God. They aren't omnipresent. You know, they can't be in all places and they, they aren't all knowing. They aren't omniscient. They, they, that, that's why I said a good argument could be made that, that either there's so many of them and of course they communicate to where they can get the answer from a, another demon who does know, or there's one that has been assigned to your life and your family's life before you and therefore was there and is able to answer. Um, now, that's just my opinion on it. Um, you guys may have uh, another take on it, but... Um, <clears throat> brother, I just want to say, you know, uh, from what I've researched also about Halloween is that the jack-o'-lantern, the pumpkins that they call out of the faces, the horrifying thing about that that a lot of people seem to uh, not know is that um, it actually symbolizes the, the heads of uh, sacrificial victims that were sacrificial victims were beheaded by ancient druids. And they carried these heads around with them. And then later it became the thing of a, a pumpkin being caused. We live in a postmodern time and you can basically believe whatever suits you best, which is also something that, as I understand it, you find in the New Age. And obviously with progressive Christianity, you have a lot of New Age beliefs coming into the churches and infiltrating the churches. So that was just the thought that I had that I wanted to share. I don't know um, if um, Joto or Gary wants to comment on that, on that or um, you, Brother Jeremy. Yeah, I will. I'd actually like to hear what jo uh, Brother, uh, Do excuse me, Dr. Burton uh, has to say about it. Um, I know that Brother Gary Wayne has talked, not today, but before about uh, the the jack o' lanterns specifically, and how they were originally uh, turnips, and mm -hmm. then how it, it it progressed. But uh, I'd like to hear what Dr. Burton has to say on on that subject. Certainly, uh, well, Terius is exactly right. I, I mean, the um, you know, kind of the the interesting thing about um, the um, the jack-o'-lanterns is that they were representative of, of sacrificial victims. And, um, you know, people can, people can dispute this all they want to, but the fact of the matter is, is that we have, you know, they're slightly slanted in bias sources, but we have accounts from Greek and Roman historians, historians from late antiquity. We have, you know, we have accounts from the dark ages about, uh, these kinds of practices uh, waning though they were, uh, by the time that the Dark Ages pull around, but you know, like the Wicker Man is another uh, another Celtic sacrifice, which I'm sure Gary is, is very familiar with and Tertius as well. Um, but you know, it's it, these ceremonies that were practiced in sort of of uh, you know watered down for popular consumption um, are are largely attested to. So there's really not not much in the realm of, of debating their existence or the relation to to the the modern practices in halloween um but getting back to um what also what, what gary was talking about with the you know the procession of of honoring the dead and and the the agrarian cycles of dying crops and the renewal in the spring um it's the, the timing of what's going on in the middle east right now is, is interesting as well because of of the subject matter that we're talking about here um, you know, the, the current conflict happened in the wake of Yom Kippur uh, and the, uh, you know, again, most of the audience are going to be familiar with the atonement sacrifice in the, in the Old Testament uh, and it's, its usage of um, sacrificial victims, animal victims, goats in this case, uh, and, and the further association with the atonement with Azazel, uh, the, the fallen entity uh, referenced sparsely in the Old Testament, but but quite more so in the apocryphal literature that gives commentary uh, on, on books like Genesis. Um, and if we go to books like Enoch, we see that, that Azazel was intricately connected with the occult. Uh, it was one of the things that he taught um, to humanity. It was one of the things that he, it, it, again, if we're to believe Enoch, 
um, it's one of the things that got him in the most trouble because he's he's referenced as revealing the the mysteries of heaven before the timing uh, was proper to do so. And of course, again, most of the audience are going to be familiar with the fact that they corrupted, uh, you know, this angelic knowledge, uh, this knowledge that was trafficked amongst the the sons of God, as it were, uh, and it was corrupted for consumption by humanity. So I think that the timing is is not coincidental. I, I suspect um, uh, in terms of what's going on in the Middle East and um, the timing of the year, uh, and it, it, the. The, the sacred geography at play is also very interesting as well. And I, I don't want to get, get off on too much of a tangent, but I think that it's at least marginally related to what's going on. Um, these portions of the Levant uh, were, were uh, you know, particularly the ancient Philistine. Um, uh, high places. Yeah, they were high places, but they were also enclaves of, of Rephaim. Um, so there, there's definitely, a, a, as all of us here know in the audience as well, there's definitely this spiritual um, battle that's taking place, you know, behind all of all of the physical manifestation of conflict. Um, and I think it's it's also telling that the the Rephaim, variously translated as as the shades or wraiths or dead ones, uh, that is also very telling. I, I think and and commentary that should give believers pause uh, and pay more attention to uh, what's going on. But to uh, for believers. The timing shouldn't be shouldn't be a, a huge surprise, I think, uh, particularly because of the uh, the in, in fact the calling that's put on all of us as believers, as Christians, to to be wary of this spiritual battle. You know, you 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 cited uh, Ephesians chapter six a moment ago. Um, you know, it seems like every every month, every day, almost every week, you know, there's something new that should grab a Christian's attention. In terms of how much of the spiritual conflict is beginning to bleed into, you know, our physical reality, if I can use that kind of imagery. Um, but I, again, I suspect that it's not coincidental uh, that all of this is happening uh, at its timing. Yeah, agreed. Um, and we we named that episode um, "Antichrist Agents of Chaos," um, and I think there's a very I mean, I'm not setting any kind of dates or uh, trying to give any kind of prophecy because I'm no prophet. But I think it's very possible that this conflict could uh, turn into a much larger one, um, depending on how open a role Iran chooses to play. And whether certain countries decide to take part in it and if it does in fact grow into a big enough conflict say world war um i think i think if it does that i think it's a near certainty that you we're gonna see the man of lawlessness rise to power out of it um to you know as a coming as a, a savior uh, type figure um you know to put a stop to all of the the conflict crying peace and safety and um you know regardless of where you fall on the the side of the rapture what you believe as far as the timing of it that's irrelevant um because there is going to be a man the man of sin is going to rise to power um that is something that all christians believe unless they fall into the category of, um, you know, preterist, partial, or full, or um, historicist, in which case, of course, they believe that it's already happened, even in the sense of historicists 
and all millennialists who see that it's something that has happened throughout history and is largely symbolic. Um, but as far as historic premillennialism, which is a lot different than modern futurism or, or dispensational premillennialism, but historic premillennialism that the anti-Nicene church uh, believed for the most part um, that a lot of people don't realize. You know, a lot of people believe that all futurism is a Jesuit invention. But that's not the case. Um, uh, you can definitely argue and see that part of it uh, was probably a Jesuit invention to combat the the view of the historicists from the Reformation that the Pope was the Antichrist, but you know, historic premillennialism is something completely different. And going by historic premillennialism, the man of sin is going to come to power. And he's probably going to be seen as the Jewish Messiah. Christ was the real Messiah. Satan is the ultimate counterfeiter. Um, you know, anti means against, but it can also mean opposite. And Antichrist in the way I see it, will probably be someone accepted by the Jewish people as their Messiah and will probably rise to power out of a conflict. For any of the audience that isn't familiar with the Albert Pike, Giuseppe Manzini letter, uh, they outlined the three world wars in very, very good detail. Now, there's been no third world war as of yet, at least not the way it's outlined in the letters, but the first two world, war, world wars happened exactly the way that it was said in the the pike letter that it was going to and it's not because either of these men were prophets it's because they were a uh, part of the entity that the god of this world as jesus and the bible calls our adversary i mean little g god the the prince of this world um, you know, he is there, there. There was a reason that he was able to offer Jesus all the kingdoms of the world when he tempted him. I mean, Jesus quoted scripture to him. He didn't say these aren't yours to offer me, you know, not that he created them or that he owned them, but rather uh, more. An easier way to understand it is that he held the deed. Um, because of the, the the fall of man in the garden and um, the sin that separated us from God and uh, really took at least the majority of our um, trying to think of the best word our uh, stewardship of the earth um you know the earth was made for mankind but it was made for mankind the way that god created mankind um whether it's the six day man that brother gary um uh, likes to uh, talk about that I 
enjoy hearing him talk about, or, you know, you're talking about Adam and Eve who were created and um, from the, the earth and then Eve from Adam. Uh, I don't see any scriptures that say, I mean, and Gary can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see any scriptures that say that any mankind that were originally created by God were created fallen. Um, if I'm wrong, then I, I'll gladly admit it and apologize. But sin entering the world and disobedience is what I see the Bible stating pretty clearly that caused mankind to fall and give authority over the earth to the enemy. And it's that authority that Jesus is taking back with the the scroll, the, with the seven seals. Um, uh, BDK from Omega Frequency is the first one I ever heard describe it this way, that the, the, the scroll is the title deed to the earth. And um, what we are seeing is the seals are broken is Jesus taking back the, uh, the, the, the deed from the one who's been leasing it um and that is a very uh poor or at least loose um <laughs> symbol uh paraphrase but hopefully everyone understands what i'm trying to to bring across but brother gary what say you on that subject or any other well, you covered a lot of territory, so. <laughs> um, I mainly meant like um, the what Judd started off talking about as far as what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I fully I fully agree that uh, dates when you have attacks by the occult forces as opposed to ones who may not think that they're uh, led by them, but certainly the ones that are led by occult forces by their gods they will select days to honor their gods for sacrifice so those days are very very important to them whether they're secret societies whether or not they're the various occult religions around the world and the seasons that they pick and the point in the seasons are all it's not by accident it's not by fluke and so to pick a season where they're going to seek vengeance so to speak against god's chosen people as the nation that he created uh from the people that you know descended from the people that he saved descended from the adamites created to be the resolution to the angelic rebellion and you have azazel the scapegoat um, that is sacrificed as the second goat on the day of atonement is likely no um is likely no a coincidence in that uh we're not told what those sins are when that goat is sent out to the wilderness, which certainly Azazel is also being depicted as. So I think it's actually for the sins of the antediluvian world. But if you're in a spiritual war and you're honoring your gods, you're going to pick specific days to launch these types of sacrifices. And then they will reflect the kinds of destroyer sins of the destroyer Azazel of the antediluvian world who supplies most of the illicit knowledge, supplies the arts of war, martial arts, warfare, craft, strategies, the whole bit, and is likely the same as the Shiva god, which believes in renewal through destruction, which is the destroyer god that we understand as Abaddon and Apollyon, which is likely Azazel as the leader of the angels that went to uh, the uh, to the abyss in the book of Enoch. Uh, I think none of that could be sort of considered coincidental. So I look at everything that they do in that belief system is designed to do four things. One is to lead people away from God, number one goal. Number two is, is to slander God. And they slander God for their celestial mafia godfathers because th those celestial fallen angels 
the Shemaim, as I like to call them, the Nephilim of the Shef of the Shemaim, they know the power of God. They're not going to slander God directly. They're not going to get their hands bloody. They're going to use their spirits offspring and then all the people that they can convince to follow them to do those things. These are these beast sort of spirits that are talked about sort of biblically. And so when we look at uh, the things that they're going to do for their gods as well is to not give God credit for anything, right? And then the fourth thing is to honor their pantheon gods in all ways. They name everything after them. And if you look at the seven sacred sciences that merged with that knowledge before the flood, and you look at the seven liberal arts taught in universities through degrees and all the architecture and everything being named after the gods and the occult things, it's the same belief system uh, that is controlling this world as it was before. And so we should not be surprised if they're in that sort of service, they're going to do things to those four main uh, goals and, and agendas. And one other thing uh, I, I thought maybe I'd throw out for people to in the audience to consider is this idea of this mask at Halloween. And the mask, whether or not it's what they, they're trying to do with the medical mask, which is kind of a similar tactical play in their belief system, is very similar to people putting the white uh, makeup on their face. It's very similar to what the jesters and the clowns do. And it's very similar to theater masks. And in the theater masks um, in China, you have these demonic looking faces that would be more reflective on it, but they're still wearing these masks. And in that theatrical aspect, uh, it's an allegory for all of this other stuff that goes on in their occult rituals is they're trying to become the people that they're playing. They're trying to, in the new age terminology, channel that individual. So who they're trying to do is they're trying to dismiss the host cover the face and who you're going to see is that demonic figure that they're inviting in to talk about their history and the theater is designed to talk about their history and their uh, great individuals and and sort of raise them up as, as sort of you know terrific demigods so to speak and so when we look at all of that imagery of the of the mask and then the characters behind it they're trying to, with the Day of the Dead, they're trying to marry that together, and they do marry that together throughout the whole world now, where they create opportunities for the demons to possess people. I think, um, uh, I'm very... I, I'm going to hush and, and let you talk, Tredius, I promise. I just... I was wondering no, 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 no. if uh, Brother Gary Wayne had happened to see the uh, the episode of By Their Fruits, um, Jeremy and John did, uh, uh, I think the title of it was The Nephilim Look Like Clowns. Um, and mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it brings a whole nother layer to what Brother Gary was saying about the, the mask. And um, I think it's understanding conspiracy that the, name of the channel um that i know he's from the uk that uh jeremy and john had on with them uh he, he actually wrote a book and paul his, you're talking about paul stubbs uh, that might be um i think that might be write a book about, about clowns that's going to be coming out right away yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. The the book that's about to come out about the Nephilim looking like yeah. clowns. Yeah, I did a show with him um, yesterday. That's really yeah. so familiar. Awesome, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, said, I did a show with him on on crazy clowns like six or seven years ago, and we did a whole show on that. So when you said uh, Mike Stub, or I mean uh, Paul Stubbs, I was picturing Mike Stibbs, um, and that's why I I was kind of hesitant. I was trying to think is. That but it's just similar last names that threw me. But um, when you consider all the different cultures who wear the face paint and the mask, um, it, it brings a lot of credence to his, uh, I don't even want to call it a theory, but his belief of, um, about the connection between clowns and the Nephilim. Um, I think, I don't think anybody would argue with me that John Wayne Gacy was uh, possessed. <laughs> and, you know, so there you have uh, a serial taker of life that um, 
dressed as a clown. <laughs> and it, it, it was just very, uh, it was interesting to me, um, especially because a lot of people dress up as clowns um, for Halloween or at least something to do with painting the face and wearing the mask. But uh, I, I'll turn it back over to you now, Tertius. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that um, uh, Gary made a lot of good points as, as usual, but one of the things that, that I that got stuck in my head now was when you talked about the white masks. Now, in, in South Africa, where I live, um, the white masks are also a big thing among many of the uh, indigenous cultures we have here. And um, many of them also have this thing of ancestral worship. Where they worship, they they believe that the ancestors are mediators between them and God the Father. And I always tell them, um, I've taken some of them on, and I I've, I tell them, well, read First Timothy two verse five. It says there's one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. So if and I, I also tell them about the Rufaim. I tell them, listen, um, be very careful because if you if you are talking to what you claim to be ancestral spirits, I tell them about the Rufaim and. I, I mentioned uh, Dr. Judd Burton and uh, Michael Iser and Derek Gilbert and so on, and I tell them, listen, go and read what they say and, and, and read read about what who the Rephaim are, like, like uh, Judd said earlier. It's, I mean, that's what the Bible, in many translations refer to it as the shades or the um, the, the race or whatever it, um, the yeah, translation is. Yeah, and uh, so... You know, that's a that's a one thing that I was thinking of. And another thing was, um, in I think it was in 2020, our government in South Africa um, said that they want to dedicate the 8th of May. I don't know why specifically the 8th of May, but they want to dedicate the 8th of May as a day of honoring the dead, uh, celebrating the dead. But they also kind of referred to the Mexicans um, celebrating the dead and Back then, I, I warned a lot of people on Facebook and I told them, listen, if you think this is just an innocent celebration, you're making a massive mistake. This is about so much more. This is about ancestral worship, which is has to do with the Rephaim. This is this is very demonic. And um, also another thing that I just want to mention when, when Gary said earlier about, um, you know, the, the forces of darkness want people, they want to move people away from God. You see that in so many churches all over the world where, I mean, I've mentioned this time and time again when, when me and Jeremy have conversations, you you have so many churches who they don't want to mention, even mention the word demon or unclean spirit, or they don't even want to talk about angels. They You will never hear them have a sermon on spiritual warfare, ever. Um, and that's kind of a way in which a lot of churches got infiltrated. And, you know, you, if, if you have an army of soldiers and they get infiltrated by a bunch of agents from the enemy, obviously, if you can um, unlearn them, if you can unlearn the tactics that they were supposed to learn and stuff, and you make them naive about warfare and so on, um, I mean, they are easy targets. It's it's basically the, the easiest targets that you will find. Yeah, yeah. You are absolutely right. Uh, I I think, and Dr. Burton or Brother Gary can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the the practice of the ancestor worship there in South Africa and all over the continent um, of Africa, I think that's uh, a practice found in, in voodoo and hoodoo um, of course, it's been Christianized by the Roman Catholic Church, just like uh, the Mexican Day of the Dead has um, been whitewashed and Christianized. But, you know, Paul says that anytime you are praying to little G gods that you're praying to demons, um, you know, whether it's your ancestors or it's, you know, the God of your tribe or 
you know, fill in the blank. Uh, you know, we as Christians who know and study the Bible know that that these gods are no god at all. They're demons. Now they're, I guess, Elohim, if you want to, um, you know, go to the technical part of it, the Deuteronomy 32, uh, you know, Psalm 82, Michael Heiser uh, teaching and, and, and belief on it, and it's accurate, he, he, he's correct, um, it's not something he invented, he just was one of the first to, um, you know, point it out and, and, and write big on it, write a lot on it. Um, and I thank God for his work. Um, you know, Dr. Heiser touched my life and deepened my walk and study of the scripture. He renewed my desire to study the scripture and, I will always be thankful for what God did through him because I know from talking to many people that, you know, even though I have quite a few things, well, not quite a few, even though there's a few things I disagree with him or uh, have a different viewpoint on, um, the core tenets of Christianity Dr. Heiser held to uh, very strongly um, you know he, he believed in the deity of Christ he wasn't calling these uh, entities gods in the sense of the creator um, it, it's just like how in the English language when we're talking about God Almighty, the Father, the Creator, it's capitalized. If you're talking about the gods of the nations, it's uh, not capitalized. And it's the same, uh, at least in Hebrew, with the word Elohim. And the thing that allowed me to understand what he was saying better than anything else was when he said the best way to understand these little g gods is fallen angels you know the, the, the watchers you know and it's a very important aspect of what is being celebrated in halloween and um what is being worshipped by a lot of the people who make the decisions in this world um you know it, a lot of people aren't aware of the mystery schools that are still extremely prevalent today uh, that go back to you know ancient egypt and greece and rome and you know other ancient places um some argue that the ancient mystery schools are pre-diluvian. Um, personally, I don't know. Um, I'm sure that's something that Dr. Burton or Brother Gary Wayne could answer a, a lot better than myself. But uh, is there any practices like Dr. Burton brought up the Wicker Man earlier and we, like, we still have Burning Man, uh, the festival that happens here in the United States um, that's based on the Wicker Man. Um, you know, is there any practices that take place by these occult groups on Halloween that were also practiced in, um, you know, at, ancient times or or at least going back to the first century AD or later 
Well, I, I, going back to your your question about the mystery schools, you know, in um, an interview with a giant uh, in the the recent update that I did, the most recent update I did, I included a chapter called the Primal Witch, and um, basically, our, our understanding of mystery schools from history is that these were these were traditions of of God and goddess worship. That, that one had to be initiated into. Um, it's the same kind of, um, although it's been given a kind of fraternal gloss over, it's the same kind of stuff that's practiced in, uh, in Freemasonry. It's the same kind of thing that you find in even, even Greek society and college fraternities preserve a lot of the same kind of, of mystery school approach. And of course, in the bona fide uh, occult societies, you know, that we have throughout history and even into to modernity, I'm thinking about things like the the, the Ordo Temple I warn you it is would be you know an example of a modern mystery school but that basic system of tutelage and initiation is is really begun with the watchers this first uh, they initiate humanity into the uh, literally in, into the mysteries the revealing of of in the case of, of Azazel that I mentioned a moment ago but really to one degree or another all, all of the watcher commanders at least uh, we're, we're teaching this mix of practical sciences and occult knowledge. Um, and so it's very, you know, that's really the first mystery school, you know, that we find, um, you know, again, it's hard to, hard to put a chronology. We can work with sequences, uh, but, but it's safe to say that this is pretty early on. This is archaic stuff. It's older than antiquity, uh, when that system is actually set up. And of course it's, it's to, it, it falls to the progeny of the watchers, both the pre-flood and the post-flood. Uh, giant tribes to really continue uh, these mystery schools that, that um, in a lot of cases, elite members of society uh, were initiated into. Although you do have examples in later years, like like probably the most the, the most popular, most well known mystery schools were those in the Greco Roman world, um, where you had people from all classes um, that were admitted to certain mysteries. Some of them were only for men. Some of them were mixed. Some of them were only for women. Um, but there was, um, at, at the heart of it, part of them all is this idea of, of some sort of secret gnosis, secret knowledge that's being passed along and, and utilized. And of course, this is, these practices are very much alive and well in, in occult societies today. And I know that Gary has done extensive work on a lot of these, uh, uh occult fraternities and, um, you know, I, again, as far as, as far as the historical debate is concerned, it should end as to whether, whether these modern, uh, let's say within, especially within the last 500 years, but certainly they have ancient roots. It really shouldn't be up for debate that a lot of these modern mystery schools and secret societies and fraternal orders have had a, a heavy hand in guiding geopolitics. Um, you know, even um, wh whatever people think of George Washington, um, one of the things that Washington wrote, wrote in response to a Baptist minister that was trying to tell him about uh, the Illuminati in America, Washington fires back to this guy in a letter in 1798 and, and basically tells him, Hey, look, I know that they're here. I've tried to, I've been trying to repel them from the country because he had had to deal with the, uh, well, he mentions the Illuminati in conjunction with the Jacobins uh, who fomented the, the French revolution. They were all Illuminist uh, left-wing French politicians um, that had fomented the French revolution. And even um, uh, the ambassador, uh, the French ambassador to America was a guy named um, Ambassador Genet uh, that Washington had, had had to deal with. He was trying to recruit uh, people, to fight, Americans, to fight in the French Revolution. And um, Washington might have been inclined to let them, had they not been so involved with the uh, the Jacobins and by proxy the Illuminati. So, you know, that's just that is one small piece of the historical trail in terms of document evidence that we have that, uh, you know, these organizations uh, have a pretty heavy hand. And trying to affect the outcome of, of, of geopolitics uh, for their own nefarious ends and for the, the nefarious ends of the celestial fallen entities that control them. Um, so that's I, that's a mouthful, I know, but it it speaks to the fact that these mystery schools, mystery traditions, are still very much alive and around uh, today. They they've they've ensconced themselves in our our very cultural fabric. Uh, so that it's it's hard 
in some cases to separate, let's say, national agenda from from the agenda of some of these these occult groups that are operating throughout the world. Um, and, you know, per- particularly for the ones of more Luciferian bent, uh, their their high holidays are during this season. You know, ha- Halloween continues to be the high holiday. So um, it, it again, you know, sort of bringing it bringing it into the modern sphere. It shouldn't surprise us a great deal that that we we see things happening during seasons like like the fall, the season of Halloween, uh, where you have these ma- major geopolitical shifts, uh, such as the one that we're we're potentially witnessing in the Middle East right now. Yeah, uh, I mean, Washington was definitely a deist, as were the majority, if not all, of the uh, who people think of as the founding fathers, but. Uh, whether or not he was a part of the, um, you know, the uh, the group known as the Illuminati that had infiltrated the the um, Freemasonry, um, I don't know. I, mean, I know of the letter that you're talking about very well. Um, I think that it's without a doubt, you know, just speaking to the French Revolution. But I think even in part the overthrow of the order of the day of, you know, the the um, the royal class uh, was definitely something done um, by the Illuminist, and I think that you're going to be very hard pressed to argue that uh, Ben Franklin was not an illuminist. Um, and- yeah, there, there are certainly, yeah, you could, I mean, I, I'm not one of those historians that, that completely lambasts all of the founding fathers. I, I just don't know that there's yeah, me a, either. historical evidence. Like I, that's why I always bring up Washington. You know, I, I'm not lionizing Washington. I, I just don't see enough. Oh, I knew, yeah. Yeah, but for people like Franklin and Hamilton and probably even Jefferson, you know, there's a good case to be made that in one way or another, they they were associated with, um, you know, but um, it's clear that there were that even in in things like the American Revolution and the French Revolution it's clear that these secret societies were vying, you know, for power. They were trying to affect geopolitics for their their own ends. Um, But, yeah, when you take a look, oh, my gosh. Yeah. When you take a look at at the lives of people like. uh, like Franklin and Hamilton and, and uh, uh, Wilkerson and, and some of these other guys, you know, that were, that were in a lot of cases, architects uh, of, of the American revolution. Uh, there's a good case to be made for, for the fact that these guys were illuminized. Yeah. Uh, just look at the hellfire club. Um, Absolutely. Which, you know, Ben Franklin was a part of, but uh, what about the, uh, because I know we're running out of time. What about, and it's up to you whether you want to let Gary answer first or you, but the the practices themselves that you know say were were done by the Celts that are still being done today, and I don't mean trick or treating or um, you know bobbing for apples, uh, although those things were definitely uh, parts of the original Celtic festival celebration, whatever that have been brought over into the, uh, the modern holiday, even though the meaning behind them has changed. And most people don't know the original um, reason why they were done and so forth. But what about like a, a, occult practices such as uh, sacrifices or things like the wicker man um, are there any that are being practiced by you know luciferian groups today that you know of that either of you know of i'll let gary take this one since i, I spoke i'll let him close this out yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I just thought I'd throw a little bit uh, first on um, that sort of connection of Masonry and Illuminati with the founding of, of the U.S. and before that as being the 
you know, the plan of the Templars, which you're, you're moving up the royal uh, bloodlines and uh, the royal Masonic orders. The Masons are the lowest. So we know there's a lot of Masons there. We know Franklin and a few other ones probably rose a little bit more. We know this is the period of time when the Illuminati is using the British Commonwealth um, and Masonic lodges throughout the world as they're operating locations to work on their agenda and their agenda is to work towards uh, world government and to destroy christianity as their agendas were as the main two agendas that they were wanting to do and they were higher than masons so first level of a mason is third degree in the old system 33rd degree in the scottish rite system and so they would be higher than that and so somewhere probably between you know one would think five and seven because people are overseeing lodges in the masonic system are generally about fifth degree so one would presume a little bit higher because they're located higher on the thalamic tree of the organizational structure so they'd be a little bit higher and so the jacobians were part of this royal masonic bloodlines that were also in the mix because of being taken off the throne and the hanovers coming over to replace them and the, the fighting between the catholic jacobians and the and the protestants and so there's a lot of good reasons for george washington to say and and saying i don't want those european things going on even within our hierarchical system to be using us as a pawn or a servant to them. And so there's a lot of concern as to what the Illuminati will play. And even though they're allowed to, per they're permitted to operate through the lodges. So yeah, there's some tension there within the uh, occult societies at that time, for sure. The thing to keep in mind though, is all, they're all still working towards the same agenda. So that's the thing you have to keep in mind. Now, when we talk about uh, what the secret societies do in their secret rituals, uh, it's very hard to get accurate detailed information except from people who have come out of the secret societies because they swear oaths even upon death not to at the depth level to give up these secrets not that it, it doesn't sort of get get out there but the difficulty though is that you're not sure what is misinformation and disinformation and what is actually facts because always going to be some details in there that uh, might might show some um, uh, legitimacy to it so and they're always playing the masses so but what we do know is, is the rituals that they do at the adept level, they have a strong sense of history and tradition. And so they carry on at those adept, secret, high-level adepts. And um, one would presume that an average Masonic Lodge, only the, the adepts would be part of these lower uh, level of adept rituals. And as you move up, you would have even more secrecy and different kinds of more illuminated because you know more you're closer to being a god in this world as you move up in that sort of belief system so we have to take them at face value we don't know exactly what they do at each level for the most part um, but we do know they're going to do blood drinking we know they're going to do animal sacrifices we know they're as you move up at the higher levels they're going to do children sacrifices they're going to do human sacrifices they're going to do sexual rituals and all sorts of different things but to have a smoking gun evidence of that you'd have to be at that at those levels and then somehow smuggle out some information other than what your eyewitness would would do but it's the same religion of history it's not it's not going to change at that leadership level. And, you know, um, we have that organizational structure that was before the flood and then again after the flood. And it's the same. I mean, you have, you know, from my sort of view, you have the Nephilim versus the Rephaim before the flood, but you have all of this knowledge and this legal oath-based system being imposed on the world, beginning with the harem and Athema, and maybe even before that, uh, that you have, you know, some of the things we sort of hinted at all the way through this world, that it's their world and it's a legal based system. And I think that's sort of the start of it. And the knowledge that is provided to intermix with the development of the Enochian seven sciences um, for, is going to form the mystical religions, which forms the mystical uh, mystery schools before the flood. And is that Enochian mysticism or uh, Atlantean mysticism or the bull cult or the sun cults, they're all the same names for the same type of religion that is going to provide the priesthood and a bloodline of priesthood that works through the bloodlines of the demigods of the giants and they have an organizational structure of owning the uh the kingships they own all the high positions of the religions and they own all of the ruling class of the warriors in terms of the armies so they're they're operating all of those top levels and that's the system that crosses the flood 
and one can dream up a lot of different ways uh, to, that it gets there. But according to the Gnostics and according to Freemasons, it's this fellow called Hermes as part of the Trismegistus who finds all of this knowledge of the religion and the knowledge that was written down into, it's a solar number, 36,525 books supposedly on nine vaults buried under the pyramids, takes that back to Nimrod after the flood, who institutes that Enochian mysticism from before the flood and that knowledge to help building Babel City, Babel Tower and whatever else he had planned for Babel with that kind of knowledge that begins that organizational structure after the flood. So we need to take to heart, I think, my opinion, my speculation, Ecclesiastics, where it says, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. What was will be again. And that we're seeing that complete system rise to the surface as they start to prepare for if we are in the fig tree generation. And I, I think we are. I think we have to be careful with the chronology on that. But I think but I think uh, they're bringing that full surface and we're seeing it exposed more and more and more. They are getting more hubris in their approach. And we should expect to go through those tribulations because none of that bodes well for the people they like to sacrifice. Yeah, you are absolutely right there. Um, none of it bodes well for uh, those who already know that we're not, I mean, we, it's an open book test. You know, we're able to see um, what's in store for us. And the thing is, is it's not just Christians who, um know that these things are coming uh those who are in power and i'm not talking presidents i'm talking uh those who are really in power your uh world bankers and you know those who ha have financed the bullets bandages and bombs of every side of every war uh, war and world war uh they they definitely believe what the book of revelation says just not the way we believe it they see uh their god as the victor and they're looking for their champion um and we have no reason to fear him or anybody else because yes we if we're alive to see that time we certainly uh will be persecuted and killed but death is not something for the christian to fear you know um whether people like to think about it or not, we're all dying from the time we're born. Um, and that's because of the curse of sin and death. And that's what is so beautiful and so awesome about Jesus. He is the only way to be reconciled with the father and he takes the sting out of death and it is something that goes from a horrendous fear to a blessed hope brother gary i want to thank you so much for joining us on this annual exposing halloween episode um, we're all getting ready to uh, end the episode but i know you have to go now so i want to just say thank you and i can't wait for your book to come out uh, do you want to tell people i'm gonna put it in the comp in the description either way but do you want to tell people where um they can find you on youtube or your website yeah the best place to get a hold of me is through my website that's the genesis six conspiracy.com the number six conspiracy.com and as i mentioned earlier there's a generous excerpt of both uh books up on that if you wanted to get a signed copy 
there's a page for Canada, there's a page for the US, there's a page for overseas. Um, there's also uh, links over to barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com and amazon.ca uh, and a link over to the Kindle version. The same will be available for the new book and uh, I'll hopefully have all of those links and things up here over, over the next week or so. And I also wanted to just sort of uh, thank everybody for the, uh, allowing me to be on the show today and, and to hopefully help contribute. And to just leave with uh, one little more comment on my last sentence, and I probably should have added on to that, that um, even though we're likely going to be going through tribulation, um, we just need to have the armor of God and continue with the testimony of Jesus and, and, and God and the Holy Spirit. And we'll just have to put our hands in the hands of God, pray for rapture, but prepare for tribulation. Yeah, uh, well, I... Um... I think that that was very well said, and it's something that people should definitely take heed to. And, you know, you're right. Uh, we have nothing to fear, but we should prepare at the same time. I am the Remnant Warrior saying, until next time, grace and peace, and God bless you all. <laughs>